Father, we just come before you and ask that the Holy Spirit teach us now and make your word come alive. If it's never come alive before, make it come alive today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I have a few notes to hand out, partly for the kids, but for adults too. Uh, if you can, uh, Marika and Ileana, can you help Anna and Ruth maybe hand them out quick? And just uh, last, I think the first Sunday of the year, I spoke on how to study your Bible just a little bit and told you about, I don't know how it's been going since then. You passed about six, six and a half months or, or so since then. I hope something in it was a help to you. I'm going to do it a little different but it's today, but still to do with the Bible. So I know maybe you all don't have pens, but uh, it would be good if you committed it to memory as well. Some things, I left some blanks, kids can fill out. Just the kids can answer this question, okay? Kids, where do we go to find out about God? Boobin. The Bible. Was that a question, Boobin? Oh, okay. you got to say the Bible. All right. Good. To want to thank you guys for all the help at VBS. I was just amazed, all the kids. I don't think the pictures could show you justice what happened here, but some of you who had the, especially the little ones, I'm not good at watching real little ones. So I thank you for coming and spending a day or half a day with the little ones. It was great to see all that help too. Um, somebody had the le- on the leaflet of their Bible these words, and I, oh, I wanted to welcome you guys. See. Halsey and Shirley with us, and, and Bonnie, that's your brother, right? If I, I missed him last week, Ed, Edward, so welcome to be here with us. I know Robin's father's here too, back there, so thanks for, and welcome any other visitors too. I'm just kind of scanning quick, but uh, welcome you guys, God bless. But uh, on the leaflet of somebody's Bible, they had the, this penned in there, it says, this book will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from this book. And it's true of prayer as well. I've heard about prayer before, but what a good thing to put in the back of your Bible. This book will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from this book. And I think that's a true statement. That's not a Bible verse, but it's a good proverb that works. And I believe it. And if you notice in January, I handed you out a, a Bible reading records where you could read the Bible and just keep track of where you've been because you can forget and uh, get confused and, and not know where you're turning. And I find it very helpful to, to know that. So I can kind of keep track and we can go through it. And I find it helpful. But on the front cover, if you remember, there's a picture of a Bible and it's kind of got a dusty, you can see a dusty finger there it was covered in dust. And so I put this statement on here by Howard Kent Hendricks there. And he says this, dusty Bibles always lead to dirty lives. It's in your notes here. Dusty Bibles always lead to dirty lives. In fact, you are either in the Word of, and the Word is conforming you to the image of Jesus Christ, or you are in the world, and the world is squeezing you into its full, into its mold. Let me read it again because I think it's a very true statement. Dusty Bibles always lead to dirty lives. In fact, you are either in the Word, and the Word is conforming you to the image of Jesus Christ, or you are in the world, and the world is squeezing you into its mold. And you can look at uh, Romans chapter 12 if you wanted more insight into that. But I, um, there are more Bibles in print today than ever before. And we are a privileged people to have so many Bibles available and so on. But I think the problem with it is that in this country we have so many, and I even have probably a dozen at home. But I think the case is a lot of times people don't read it. If they read it, they don't study it. Or if they study it, sometimes they don't apply it. And it really comes down to that in the end. Um, I'm gonna, I, I've read books, and maybe you have too, on how to study the Bible. I don't know about you, but I found them helpful. 
maybe not everything in the in in the books, but I find books on how to study the Bible very helpful, especially if they're written by godly men. <laughs> um, and so I've done that. I've, I've read quite a few books on it. Uh, this will help us, I believe, and it's going to be very basic today so that the kids grasp it and uh, it can be simple. And the Bible is not that difficult in, in many ways. And so I want to just go into that again, how we can do it. You know, as, I, as a kid growing up, and most of you know I was a wrestler, and pretty much wrestled all my life. I still like to do it, still get a chance to do it a couple times a week. And it's something I've always loved. Some people would say, oh, I don't see how you can do that. I don't see how you guys can run. And you know, Claire's going 11 miles and getting ready for a marathon. So I'm thinking, good night, you guys are crazy. But anyway, I'd rather wrestle. I think it's, you get hurt less. And, uh, but anyway, I, as I was in high school and beyond, I went to these wrestling camps. You have wrestling or basketball camps. Matt does basketball camps. I did the wrestling camp thing every year. I'd go to Wisconsin. People would come from all over the nation. There'd be hundreds of wrestlers there. And you wake up early in the morning if you're one of those, well, okay, I won't say it, but they get up at five to run. And you didn't, that was optional unless uh, you got in trouble. So I usually skip that part because I wanted to save it for wrestling. But anyway, you learn so much there and you're just saturated. You're with Olympic wrestlers, uh, people who are gold medalists. And so you got the top people teaching you things. And, and that's a good idea. You know, if you're going to learn something, learn something from people that know that field, right? And I say that about the Bible because I, the funniest thing is I hear people go to the strangest places to learn about Bible. Sometimes friends who don't know a thing about it, but they've heard things repeated and they just repeat what they've heard. Oh, there are contradictions in the Bible. You can't believe it. And they'll believe somebody that says that who's never read the book, can't even point you to one contradiction. And yet, isn't it funny, you go to the wrong place, the wrong people. But in, in wrestling camp, they bombard you with information. And from early morning to late at night, you're wrestling. And then there's tournaments on top of it. And physically, you're exhausted by the end of the week. And I remember in there just being bombarded with information. And maybe you feel a little bit that way about church. And, and maybe you feel that way sometimes about studying your Bible or reading a book on it. But what my hope is you do is do what I did, took away something from the wrestling camp. I couldn't remember everything. I tried to keep notes. I, I even, one year they let me record, tape record, back in the days when you tape record, record the sessions so I could go home and remember those things. But you know what? You take a few things that make a difference in your game and totally change it. And one of those things for me was you could get a two-on-one on somebody's arm and they're going to react. If you're a wrestler, you know what? I'm sorry I have to use these illustrations, and if it doesn't mean tough to you, you get something out of the rest of the message. But anyway, there was this one guy, he was teaching how if you did a two-on-one, grab one guy's arm with two hands, like a baseball bat, but we're able to grab it with two hands. There's only so many things that a person can do, and wrestling's a little bit like chess. I do this, he reacts, then I do this. And if you're good at wrestling, even before you shake the guy's hand, you know what you're going to try to do with him. Okay. So it, you've got things worked out. Anyway, so if you grab his hand, no matter which hand he grabs, you've got to move. He grabs this, you got an arm drag. He grabs this other hand, you fold it underneath, and he goes for a throw. I mean, it's a pretty neat move. Anyway, no, not that you guys care. But anyway, if you push on your head, you can post both arms up. His arms are stuck up like this. His legs are wide open. You take him out. And it's pretty simple. But there's a reaction. There's something you learn. And I came away thinking from wrestling camp that there's you know, there's something I can learn from it. And that affected my game and, and made me a better wrestler. And so the same thing today, maybe you'll feel like you're bombarded. I think I'm going to keep it very, very simple. So I don't think that's going to happen to you. But if you get one thing on it today, take that home and it's a game changer for you as far as the word of God comes alive. And that's my prayer and hope today for you. So uh, let's get into this uh, personal Bible study. It's not just an option. For a believer, it's it's absolutely necessary. If you call yourself a Christian and don't read your Bible, there's something something not quite right. And I'm going to show you why. If you turn to me with me, it's in your notes as well. First Peter two two. I'm just going to read the, that second verse. First Peter chapter two and verse two. It says this: As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Don't, don't miss it here. Don't miss it. The text 
says, what's the aim of the word of God? Can anybody tell me what is the aim of the word of God in this verse? Growing. That's it. Maturity. Yeah. Growing. That's the key there. Um, so it's important. Personal Bible study is important because it's necessary for spiritual growth. If you got your notes there. Uh, Jesus said, what did Jesus say? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Um, and so there you have it. You grow. You know, there's a lot of babies in this church, and we had a few ourselves, so we know what they do. But then the first thing they have is milk. And so he uses this, this word for Milk. And, and as babies get a little older and they get hungry, they get an appetite for the Bible or for the for the, the milk, don't they? And you should see Seth grab for that bottle. I mean, when he's hungry, they grab that bottle. It's they know what it is and they need it and they want it and they grab it. And they're not satisfied, are they? You hear him yakking, give him the bottle, give him something, quiet him down. So you give him the bottle, they just grab for it. Well, how about us as newborn babes, he says, as newborn babes desire the the pure milk of the word of God. This is like, for a newborn Christian, this is like milk to drink. Something that gives you sustenance, something that gives you life. And you continue, and it seems the more you get of it, the more you want. And you have to have it to grow spiritually. So if you're, if you're not reading your Bible, I can quite clearly say that you're not growing spiritually. People ask me sometimes, other pastors, well, how do you feel your, your church has grown this year? Dan? Not necessarily in numbers, I'm saying, well, that depends on the individual. And if you were to ask me that, I'd say that depends on you. Have you grown? If you've grown, then the church has grown. If you're grow not growing, the church isn't growing. The church is a body of people. And so babes desire this sincere milk. And it says that they may grow thereby. It does not say that you may know thereby. Right? It doesn't say no. Although you can't grow without knowing. Okay, but let me say this. It is possible to know without growing. You'll see why when we get to that little bit. All right, the second thing that uh, personal Bible study is important because it's necessary for maturity, for spiritual growth, to be teachers. Let me, let me show you Hebrews chapter 5, verses 11 and 14 you have there in your notes. Uh, the Apostle Paul is, uh, if we think it's the Apostle Paul, I do anyway, but. Doesn't matter. To, uh, he's writing to the Hebrews and he says this. He's talking about Melchizedek. It's kind of hard language to understand. And Paul knows it's difficult. He's dealing with difficult things. And he's writing to this group of people, these Hebrews, and he says this in verse 11. Of whom we have much to say. That is about that priest, Melchizedek, and so on. And hard to explain. I'm with them on this because I come up here on all week long. I'm trying to say, Lord, this is hard to explain. Help me. Help me explain this. And Paul says, it's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time, mark that or keep track of that. By this time, you ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk. And not solid food. See what's happening here? For solid food belongs to those who are of full age. You know, I haven't seen little um, Seth yet. I haven't seen some of the little babies in the church yet eating a steak. Coming here on Sunday morning, the mother's in the back. Here, stick this in your mouth and hand them a piece of steak, you know. And they eat this. They can't do it, can they? They're not ready for that yet. They have to have milk. And so he says, for everyone who is par uh, partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age. That is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern between both good and evil. He, what he's saying to the people, he says, I have a lot to say to you. Some things are difficult, and it's difficult because you guys are dull of hearing. Um, there, there's a deficiency in the way you hear. And so I said, I have a hard time going on by it. He said, the main reason is because you're still sucking on a bottle. 
By this time, by this time that Paul is writing, he said, time has gone by. You ought to be eating steaks. You ought to be eating everything that's solid food and, and with fiber and give you all this, everything you need. And instead, you're still sucking on a bottle. I mean, think of it spiritually. How does your life feel that way today? You know, and our kids, I said it was little, it was fine. They called me Papa, Dada, however the first words were, Papa. And I didn't mind that a bit. It was a great joy when the kids started saying Papa. And then it was Papa, Papa, Papa. And Shelly taught him to say Papa at night. Uh, so <laughs> she's tricky. No, but they usually said Mama. But anyway, I don't have a problem with that. But with 20 years comes along and John's still calling me Dada, Papa. Would you have a little problem with that? Something's not right. Right? But what about you? What about me spiritually? I think what he's saying is by now you ought to be teachers. You ought to be college professors. Instead of being a college professor, you know what you are? He says you need to go back to kindergarten and learn the ABCs all over again. He says something's not right. This is talking about us. It's a little, it gets a little personal. And so... I don't know where your learning is, but it, it, per, this is why we need personal Bible study. So that you can grow as a newborn babe, a Deb. She needs milk of the Word. She's not going to understand everything. There's difficult things in there. Yeah, but she's learning. She's growing by leaps and bounds. God's using her in the life of many other people. And so it's, it's something we, we grow by. But in order to mature, he says he's looking at it the other way too. And he says, by now some of you ought to be teachers and it's a shame you're not. You're still in kindergarten. You still have to learn the ABCs of the Christian faith. And another reason we need, and a part of it was their deficiency in hearing. You're dull of hearing. Maybe we are too. I, I think sometimes a Thanksgiving meal, you ever Thanksgiving meal and you can't wait to, but sometimes you've been just nibbling here and there on everything in the house while you wait for that meal to be made. Find the meal's made and you've nibbled so much that the big meal doesn't even taste all that good and you're so full you can hardly eat anymore. And sometimes I think that's the way it is spiritually. We're, we're in love with the world or we're tasting this and that and the word of God doesn't have the appeal and when we get to it, it's, it's kind of dry. We're dull of hearing. And I have our senses. We maybe come here Sunday morning just dragging. And uh, you're not getting much. And I know that we come here tired. I believe me. I know what it's like to sit where you are and struggle to stay awake too. But sometimes we bring it on ourselves as well. Um, let's go. Uh, the third thing. Personal Bible study is important because it's necessary for spiritual effectiveness. You have to be in this word. You have to study it in order to be effective. And we'll see that in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. It says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God or woman of God may be perfect, may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Thoroughly equipped for every good work. This book... You reading it and getting into it is going to make you, it told us what it's effective for. It's profitable. Every area of it, you open to any part and it's going to be profitable to you. Sometimes it'll tan your hide. Sometimes it'll encourage you. But it's going to equip you to be effective in ministry. Who does the work of ministry? Any Anybody want to take a stab at that? Who? Everyone, not, not just me. Not just the elders. Everyone. Are you sure about that, Bonnie? She's sure. You know what? She's right. Let me just read you a verse. You can mark it down in your notes. We're not going to take the time to look it up. But Ephesians 4, 11 and 12 says this. And he himself gave some to be apostles. It is Jesus. He gave some to be apostles, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Why? Why did he do it? For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. I had a lady leave the church. And write me months later and say, Dan, I apologize. She said, I thought the whole time I was here in the church that uh, the ministry was your job. She says, now I've learned that it, you were teaching us to do ministry and I never took the opportunity to do anything. And so you too, it's the same way with you. This Getting into this word, that was so neat to see. 
I came and I basically just partaked. I carried a camera on for VBS and maybe helped with a little bit of the games. But you know, it's neat hearing uh, Ill's, uh, um, what's that funny guy there from New York, the Romanian guy, Chris, that's it. He, he was up here talking and, and uh, Adrian and, and, and Julia downstairs doing the missionary story and stuff. You sit there and you listen. And I, say, I can say after every one of listening that they did good lessons. They were just awesome. And I sit there in awe and I say, you know what? These people read their Bible. There's no way you can get up there and be effective and do that if they're not in this book. And I just came by. I just was blown away. And I said, Lord, I thank you for these people who are doing the work of ministry. It's my job and, and the elders here at this church to equip you. That's why we have classes on evangelizing. And Bruce has done many in the past and other things. Why it's to equip you to do the work of ministry. Not so that us elders are the ones doing all the work of ministry. And so I hope that's helpful to you. And being in this word and, be, and it, being it's a profitable book will help you be equipped to do ministry. But without this book, you won't be equipped. And so study it. Work through it. Um, there's no growth apart from the word of God. And you know, let me, let me say this thing. This book has a method. There's a method to studying this book. Can I say it that way? And you'll say, no, no, I'm not sure if I agree. Let me, let me just explain it this way. And in your notes, you'll see it as well. There is a method. And there are three basic steps to Bible study. And these cannot be put in just any order. Because if we mess up the order, we mess up the result. Let me just say the first one is observation. In other words, you take a passage of the Bible and you look at it, you observe it. You see what's in it. It answers, in, uh, or let me say, put it this way. Um, observation, that's where we ask and answer the question, what do I see? What do I see? If you want to put it in your notes. It, it not only asks that question, but it begs an answer too. Right? Observing, what do I see? Observation. That's the part we're going to mostly talk about today, and I will go very quickly here. Then the second step is interpretation. The answer, it asks and answers the question, what does it mean? So you can't start there. You can't say, read a passage, what does this mean? And make an interpretation, and then try to apply it. And the third thing is application. Ask and answers the question, how does it work? Let me add a little bit more. How does it work for me? So the goal is not information. Let me say it that way. The goal of Bible is not information. The goal of the Bible study is transformation. And I so remember uh, Joshua from the Congo before going back to the Congo saying to me, Dan, what our people need more than anything else in the Congo is transformation. Changed lives. And if you're reading this book and you're not being transformed, then we're missing it. We're just hearers who deceive ourselves and we're not doers of the word. And so the goal, again, is transformation. And there's nothing greater than studying this book and the getting first-hand information. Let me encourage you. Let me say that you need first-hand information. And this book is going to help you in that way. To think for yourself. You know, people generally don't think for themselves anymore. In fact, Ravi, Ravi Zacharias has a ministry and he calls it, Let My People Think. And the reason he calls it that is because it's God's people often don't think. We just follow. We just repeat things we've heard. God helps those who help themselves. And they think, a lot of people tell me that's a Bible verse. I'll tell you, it's not. It's not even biblical. But anyway, God helps those who help themselves. And then you got other things that you can say. But check it with the word. Think for yourself. Learn to think for yourself. A lot of people don't. They say, um, they just echo what somebody else has said. And it becomes cliche and everybody says And then pretty soon everybody believes it. But learn to think for yourself. A second thing it enables you to do in Bible study is to be able to evaluate different opinions. You can look in, at several opinions and hear what other Christians are saying too. And by, by your own Bible study, you're going to come away with a conclusion. The third thing is that you find the personal joy of discovery. You know what? I've read, since I was a little kid, the Bible. I've read the book of Romans, and I've studied the book of Romans. But it's only in this last few months that that book has just opened up to me. And it's like I'm reading it for the first few times or 
first time and I'm seeing things I've never seen before and I'm putting the puzzle pieces together and saying, wow, this is awesome. I didn't know this. I mean, I know that verse, but man, I'm getting a lot more and it gives me satisfaction. And you know what? Those are the things I remember when it comes in with entangles, the, the Bible entangles with everyday life and my experiences. You can read stuff in commentaries. It, to me, it comes in one ear and goes out the other often. But when God gives me an experience and I, it's with the word of God too, and I say, wow, I remember there's no way I can forget that. And so it's going to be personal, bring personal joy to you too as you look at it. But also is to help you fall in love with the author of this book, the Lord Jesus Christ. The more you get to know it, the more you know God and the more joy comes in knowing God. And it's about a relationship with God. It's not about a religion. If you don't have a relationship with God, you can. As Dave said, it can start today. And I hope you do. Um, but that God has given us this book. What does it say that God gives us this book for? I want to communicate with you. I want to have fellowship with you. I, I left you a message here. Read this. This is my love letter to you. Read it. Apply it. And so sometimes we have to get the big picture. Sometimes we're down here below. You know, when I first moved to Swanton, I didn't know much. I didn't know the river was just outside here to my left a little ways. You know, you come, you're kind of lost. Everything's new. It's a small town, but hey, when you've never been here, things are good. But you know what? When I started taking flying lessons over here to get my pilot certificate, we took off and I saw the village of Swanton Lunch like Doug and Daniel did yesterday. And you see the city and its layout and you see the park. And oh, there's a river right there. Look at the river. Oh, look at this building. Look at that down there, the tennis courts over here. And you get a big picture of, of what Swanton looks like. And when I come back down to the ground and I walk around the town, I might be lost, but I, I run into the rivers. Oh, I, I remember the big picture. You know, so this is the way it is with the Word of God, too, sometimes. You get kind of the big picture, but sometimes you, you're studying a certain passage and you're kind of lost in it. You're kind of lost. But it's these, these pieces that kind of puzzle together as you begin to continue reading the Bible, maybe not understanding everything, but in time, in time you begin to understand, you start to see the whole picture and you say, wow, this is really neat. And so that's why I hope you do. But the first step is observation. Observation, what do I see? Let me read Psalm 100 and put this in your notes if you have a pen. Psalm 119, verse 18 says this, and I've kept this in my Bible since I was a missionary. Every day I had it where, in, as my bookmark, it says this, open my eyes that I might see wondrous things out of your law. Open my eyes. See, you can't just go to the book and start reading and expect to understand. The psalmist said, man, God, I can't understand this book without you. I need you. Holy Spirit, he was saying, Holy Spirit, teach me. As he opened the pages of this book, the Holy Spirit began to teach. And that's what I pray. God, open my eyes. I got bandages on it. I got things that people have told me through the years and, and I'm confused. And as you read it, you begin to read it. God, open my eyes. See, and he opens the eyes of our spiritual understanding. We begin to understand things. And that's what's so neat about it. Why is a one person, why is he or she a better Bible student than you or me? Can I just say they see more? They see more? Uh, you're just looking at a short little passage, but some people see. You know what? My wife, she observes things. I see things. She observes. We'll be driving. We came out of the, I think it was the, oh, it's that walking trails there called the refuge. We pull out of there and there's a house kind of burnt on the side or something. I think it was burnt or half destroyed. And Wow, that's neat. I wonder when that happened. It just recently happened. Shelly just shakes her head. Damn, it's been that way for years. You know, and I just saw it. And some people just can seem to take the Bible and open up. God, show me. And God, they're observant. They, they look at details and see it. And you get a lot more out that way. So as you pick it up, use it that way. You know, and the key is to know what to look for as well. Yeah, you know, I, I have to hand it to Bill and Bonnie. They've looked in more people's mouths than I ever hope to ever look in. <laughs> I don't know what Bill gets, how Bill gets such a kick out of that, but praise God, God gave him that want to. But, you know, if, if, if you went to Bill and said something's wrong with your tooth, you have a pain, something, Bill can look in your mouth and probably find it. 
find the problem just by looking inside because he knows what he's looking for. He's been to school. He's learned about this. And he finds something. He says, now if you ask me, hey, I don't know how far can you show me? What have you got in there? And I say, open up. Why? And I say, mm, looks good to me. Close that thing before I get grossed out. You know? But just, uh, well, I don't know what to look for. Right? And so a doctor knows what to look for. And if you're coming to the word of God, you know what to look for. You're looking, well, in my case, I, I'm looking for Jesus. I'm looking for God. But you're also looking for what is he saying? And what's he teaching? So observation, what do I see? And ask these questions. It's the only questions you can ask. Uh, six questions. Who? What? Where? When? Why? And the last one, let me put it this way. So what? All right. Let's just take them briefly and I'm going to be done. Who? If you're reading a passage of the Bible, uh, at, uh, those people are in connection with those people. Look at it that way. What do these people say? Uh, what is said about them? I'm just giving you ideas. What do you know about uh, this person from previous passages you've read? Uh, the Bible, again, is full of people. Acting, interacting, reacting. Kind of follow it. Say, what's, who, who's in this story? What did they say? Or what's said about them? Okay? I'm going to move along quickly. What? Let's ask the question, what is actually happening here? Is it a miracle? If it is, what kind of a miracle is it? Is it a parable? Is it an explanation that the Bible is giving or God is giving us? Uh, is it talking to husbands? Is it talking about what, what is happening here? What is going on? And, number, and then third is where? Uh, what's the location of this? Where in the Bible? Uh, where is it happening? And see, this is why you have to use maps. And I talked about that the first Sunday this year. Your Bible has maps, but you can get Bible. Some of them do anyway, not all of them. But find these maps. Know where you're going in there. You don't get so lost. Palestine was about the size of New Jersey, okay? So the four Gospels roughly happened in a place about the size of New Jersey. Uh, just, you know, stuff like that. To begin to follow Jesus, uh, the Apostle Paul, his travels. You can see he made basically three missionary journey trips. You can trace them as you read your Bible. Don't just pass over, I can't even pronounce that song. Look it up. Look, it means more to you. And I've been to some of those places in, in Philippi and some, and it's neat to be able to say, wow, that was a hard trip I'm sure to get here. Look at these mountains or look at this pathway. It's horrible. But you kind of get the view of it and you can do that with with these Bible dictionaries. If you can't go there, take a Bible dictionary, look at a place, study it a little bit. But take a bi uh, an atlas of the Bible and do that. Um, then ask the question, when? when did, what time of the day did it take? Often the Bible will say, this last time we looked, it was in the evening. You know, in the nighttime, things happen. And that'll give you more information about it. Context, what happened before and after we talked about that. Why? Why did God include this in the Bible? Must have a reason. All scripture is inspired by God, so it's going to give me something. Let me just read from John chapter 20, and verse 30 and 31. At the end of John, he says this, and Truly Jesus did many other signs or miracles in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. John said, Jesus did a lot of miracles. He said, but I've only written about, I think, seven of them. I've only written about seven of them. And why are these here? He says, but these are written that you may believe. That Jesus is the, the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. See, there's purpose behind it. John says, I'm writing these things. The ones that included is, I want you to believe. I want you to have life in believe. Spiritual life. And then John gets to the last verse of his whole book. And you know what he says this? In John 21, 25, he says, And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. And he closes the gospel that way. Jesus did many other things. People ask me, what did Jesus do when he was 10 years old? I have no idea. And you know what? I guess God doesn't want me to know either. So stop asking the question. He did talk about when he was 12, and you can find out what he did when he was 12. A little picture. And then you're, everything included in here is for your benefit. It's put there for a reason, so ask the question, why? But then ask this last question, so what? When it comes to me, so what? Why is it here? 
It's here for my benefit, and I need to see what's the main thing. Last week we talked about trusting God in the storms of life. Those were two weeks ago. Last week was baptism. Baptism, we can go that one just for a second. Baptism, we talked about baptism, being obedient to God's call for baptism. Muriel calls me Monday morning and says, man, I want to get baptized. You know, my 4th of July will always be remembered now. <laughs> it was the 4th of July, and I, I just went to the garden and was weeding part of that day, just thinking, Lord, thank you. You're so good. People are obedient to the word of God. God asks people to do this, and we're obeying. So I can talk about this, but if you walk out of here today, no intention of looking at this book, then you just wasted an hour of your life. Okay, two hours. <laughs> but my hope is that it hasn't been a waste of time. My hope, anything that I would tell you in person, I'm telling you from here, it doesn't make it more real if I go to your house and say the same thing. I, brothers and sisters and kids, I'm saying this to you from here because I mean it. And I hope you take it as not the word of men, but the word of God. That this is what we're reading here. And that you study this book. But come away concluding, so what? How does it apply to me, in other words? How does this passage apply to me? If it's about trust, if it's about obedience and baptism, whatever it is, say, God, it applies to me. Don't, don't say like, like I do when I read the Bible. I read a passage. Oh, boy, that would be good for Brother Hans to hear on Sunday. I'm going to preach about this. Now, this is about me. And so this, in other, for this book to get into you and to change God to change your life, you need to eat it, right? It needs to become a part of you. This is a babe begins to drink that milk and it becomes a part of that baby. And it gives nourishment to it. You can't grow spiritually. And so this is all about growth. You know what? I was at that funeral yesterday and at the reception afterwards. And I was sitting with another preacher, Serge. And he just mentioned something. I don't mean to embarrass anybody here. But the person said to me, you know what I've seen over the years? He said, I knew Michelle Kaiser before she was Michelle Kaiser. And I've seen her. And all I can say is, I've, I've never seen somebody grow so much spiritually. You know what that says to me? That says to me that somebody in this church picks up the Bible and reads it and studies it and applies it to their life and gets to that. What, how does it apply to my life? To have another pastor say that, it's a privilege. And it should be that you guys and myself included in this, that we grow but we're not going to grow apart from the word of God. And so let it become a part of your book. But first thing, and we'll look at it next week, Lord willing, uh, about uh, observation. We'll go on from there to interpretation and application to our life. But look, so this week when you study the passage, look at it more carefully. Read about the timeline. Read about these people. Get more into it. And you'll get more out of it as well. So the first step is observation. It has to be the first step. You can't start anywhere else with somebody's opinion. Don't start there. A lot of people start there and try to then, when they read it, make it say something it was never intended to say. And the problem with that is then your application is going to be illegitimate. Your application is going to be way off. Way off. And so, with the Lord's help, we'll make it, make it true. And I encourage you, the greatest thing to have as a pastor, is to have people who want to follow Jesus, people who want to study this book. Any professor, any teacher, any guy who is a certified flight instructor like Doug, he wants not to just teach his students, he wants to see pilots come out of that, right, Doug? You don't want to just see people get in an airplane and, and just want to learn, 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 and never do anything with it. You want to see people succeed. And I know about this about pilots anyway. When they hear of a student of theirs that is really succeeding, now they're flying these top jets and stuff. I had a part in that. And to say that with your life too, God has given me the privilege of being a part of your life. And when you grow, I, it fills the heart of God with joy, but also fills my heart. And I just say back to God every morning, God, thank you for these people. Wonderful people. Maybe not all of you are growing, and that's why I talked about this today. Encourage your kids, read the Bible, look for what's there. If you can't read, I know your parents. For many of you, they're reading it to you, so praise God for that. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the blessings of it here this morning. Oh, Lord, we thank you for giving it so that we can just pick it up and buy it. Almost any bookstore we can find 
this treasure that has become so common it's not a treasure to many anymore, except in certain countries. And so I ask that it would become a treasure. And I ask you, Lord, for myself, for my benefit, and for the benefit of everybody here. Lord, this week as we open up your word, open our eyes that we might see wonderful things out of your law. Teach us, Lord. You said, come and follow me, and I will teach you to become fishers of men. My learn of me, my yoke is easy, my burden light. Learn of me. And Lord, I just want to humbly say, I want to learn from you. I don't know it all. I don't know much. After that funeral yesterday and Mr. hearing about Mr. Kaiser, Lord, I don't know anything. But dear God, teach me. Teach me. Lord, with all my heart, I say, teach me. I can't lead. I can't be a preacher without you. So I ask for your help. And I thank you that you're not going to only help me, you're going to help everyone here as we apply. So Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for your sending your blessed son to die on that cruel cross for my sin, for our sins. We should have hung there shameful. Yet you took my place. And I just say this morning, thank you. Now I want to live the rest of my life for the one who died for me and rose again. So bless this day, we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.